Anyway, it's a pleasure to welcome Richard Little back today. He's a professor emeritus of geology at Greenfield Community College, and he's been exploring the geology of our region for the past 50 years. He's the discoverer of the rare armored mud balls in the <laughs> Connecticut Valley. Yes, and, smile when you say that. Yeah, <laughs> what is a rare armored mud ball? And he's written a book and produced two videos on the local ge geology. And he has one of his books up here for sale. You wish to buy one later. Uh, Richard Little also leads fantastic landscape tours and has a website which is earthview, as one word, dot rocks. Correct? And are there listings of your yes, activities? Yes, yeah, you'll find all sorts of stuff there. Great. So. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Gigi. You're hey, thank you. Uh, so we're doing like a half billion years of history today. So how long can you stay? Until Sunday at two. Okay, Sunday till two. I think everybody wants to be out of here by one o'clock. Right? Is that about right? If you have to leave earlier, go ahead. I'm going to go through things fairly quickly, but um, I'm hoping to end up with a few minutes to spare so you can come up and at least have your chance to see, hold, and appreciate the rare armored mud balls. This one's been cut on a rock saw, by the way, because it used to be whole. Oh, no. Now it's half. So anyway, uh, let's find out what all these things are about. And we're going to go into the deep history of Amherst and vicinity today. And I do have a book that I'll tell you about in just a minute. But just so you'll know, it's $15, which is as best as you can get it. I pay the tax for you. <laughs> it's not very nice. So let's go on and see what we have here. First of all, there's an advertisement, because I do lead tours, as Gigi was saying. So we go all over the place, actually, from Scotland to Iceland to the national parks of the Southwest. So uh, just to let you know what's coming up here, we're doing Iceland in 2020. We do have a few more spaces left. This will be about our eighth trip there. Death Valley in January, Hawaii in March, just a few spaces left if you want to go to Hawaii and see all the new eruptive phenomena there. Uh, Yellowstone and then Scotland in September, and we got about six spaces left in Scotland. So anyway, uh, get on my email list if you wish, and if you don't get on the list today, there's a pad up front here, just email me. There's also a, a handout today. I made 15 copies. They may be gone. If you didn't get a copy and you'd like these oh, there is a couple left. Okay. Um, if for some reason you want a copy, um, just email me, all right, and I will electronically send it to you. If you do email me without my official address, you can always do a Google search and make sure you say Richard Little Geologist, otherwise you'll get Little Richard. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's not quite geology. There is some rock stuff in there. But also, I have my book for 15. The DVDs are left in my truck, which is like a half a block away. So if you want those, I can walk you over and get them. But we do have a special on these DVDs, uh, $5 each. But today, they're two for 10. <laughs> <laughs> so let's go back to the program. I got back from Iceland uh, just this past June. And you know, one of the places I love to go in Iceland, and everybody goes there, if you go to Iceland, you'll take this tour that will take you out here. But this is the Stroker Geyser. It's the prettiest geyser in the world because you can stand right up next to it and it comes out of a pool and it just comes up and up and up and up oh, right in oh, front of you. Whoa, oh, isn't that something? Yes. How and often? then if you uh, keep watching, it goes back in. <laughs> How often does it come up? It does it every five minutes. Oh, so, oh. you know, if you've been at Old Faithful and you happen to have missed it, you wait an hour and a half. But here, oh, let's take it from this side. Let's take it from that side. But I'll give you a big hint. Where the water is wet on the path, do not stand there. <laughs> and it's tempting to do that because, you know, everybody is over on this side will say, well, let's get away from the crowd right, and yes. get it from here. But, of course, that's where the boiling water rains down on you right there. So is it? It's boiling. Oh, oh yeah, so you don't want to be over there. Okay. You do not want to be over there. Anyway, that's the Stroker Geyser. And come to Iceland if you can with me or just get there on your own. I also give advice, by the way, if you are going someplace that I typically go to, I'll 
I'll tell you where to go. How's that? <laughs> if you're too annoying, I'll really tell you where to go. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, let's go back to the program. What is it about today? I want you to remember this. It's the best place in the world to study geology. And let's see why. Look at this overview of the area. There's a lava flow. That's the Holyoke Range. You all recognize where we are here. Hamlet is just out of the picture, but there's uh, the Oxbow over in Holyoke. And dinosaur footprints and sedimentary rocks, old Lake Hitchcock. Oh, yeah, the dinosaur footprints. <laughs> so um, it's the best place in the world to study geology. Now, this is a talk at the Historical Museum. And you guys deal with time here. But let's take a look at the deep time. We call it geologic time. You know the age of the Earth is three and a, a four and a half billion years old. But do you know how much a billion really is? <coughs> it's a lot. <coughs> So here's my way of introducing this to you. How much time is one billion seconds? So there they are, seconds are going by like this. A billion seconds, give me a guess from the audience. A billion. Years. How many years? 40. 40 years, that's really close. It's actually about 31 and something. Wow. But you know, over 30 years, that's a billion seconds. Yeah. That's a lot. And so when you start talking about billions of dollars and now trillions of dollars, that's a thousand billion. I mean, talk about mind-boggling, it really is. But for geology, we have four and a half billion years to drift continents and evolve life, and so there's a lot of time, even though it only says four and a half. So, uh, has there been a lot of changes? Of course, lots of changes on the life and the land, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, <laughs> so everybody knows that. And so, going on. Uh, the tectonic system here, the, the crust is drifting around, and you probably have all heard about plate tectonics, I am sure. And if we have continents that collide together, they're going to squeeze up everything that was in the ocean in between, and that's going to be where Amherst was a while ago, up okay. in the mountains. So we'll talk about that story next. So in any event, this is the best place in the world to study geology. It's just laid out right across the valley. And many of you probably know bits and pieces of this story, but let's go on and find out more. <coughs> so, uh, where are we? Uh, map of Amherst, of course, and you like to do Google Earth? Okay. And the, kind of my funny story about Google Earth is, I remember the exact moment that I went from dial-up to cable. <laughs> You ever try to get Google Earth on dial-up? <laughs> like, oh, awesome. And then all of a sudden it popped in. Well, anyway, uh, so here we are at the intersection of uh, Route 9 and 116, right up in here. And I did a talk at the Hitchcock Center. You probably know where that is down over here. So we are right in the middle of Lake Hitchcock here, the old glacial lake. And so Glacial Lake Hitchcock, the shoreline, if you know your contours, is around 250 feet above sea level. And if we take a look at where we are, you know, we're right here on this little bump right there. So we were an island in the lake. That's Amherst College's bump right there. <laughs> so there's Mount Warner. There's Amherst College on this little bump. And so we came up the hill, and so we're somewhere like right in here. UMass, a little bit further over there. And if we take a look at that picture, this is the floor of, you met, of the old lake, that flatness where the fields are. And then, see these bumps here? Mm -hmm. That's part of the island, and those are made up of something called drumlins, which we'll talk about yeah. in just a bit. So there's the lake floor. The lake shore goes right along here, like right around the roof of uh, the Mullen Center. And then there's the island that you were just seeing on that previous map. Well, what are drumlins? Drumlins yeah. are glacial till. <coughs> The ice went over the glacial till and it shaped it. So you might think of it as kind of like what um, waves do to sand, they make ripple marks. Well, when glaciers come along, it's not like a ripple, but they are a series of hills that are oriented in the direction of the glacier flow and they tend to be steeper on the up glacier side and more gentle on the down glacier side. But they're oriented. You see, they're oriented in the direction of the glacier flow. Let's take a closer look. Topographic map once again. Look at these nice little hills that we see here, here, here. Amherst College is on one. There's another one right there. And so where are we? We're like right, right over here. So you see we're on the side of a bunch of <coughs> drumlins here. And they extended above the level of Lake Hitchcock. 
So those were just a bunch of drum notes. How about that? The Hitchcock Center is on the drumlin right at the shoreline, so they look out from that vantage point across the lowlands of the Amherst Valley here, and that's the bed of Lake Hitchcock, almost totally the way it was when the lake drained 14,000 years ago. I mean, the lake left, and boom, there it was, big, flat, swampy land. <clears throat> so, anyway, uh, Hitchcock Center, us, Holyoke Range, and there's the lake. It's, has made quite a difference in the final uh, shaping of our topography. So if we were here way back then, we could have looked at the surrounding lake and the ice was melting away. And um, as you can see, the old lake bottom kind of surrounds us here and we're on these islands of drumlins. Mm -hmm. So anyway, right outside the mm -hmm. Historical Society, if you looked up to the north, there would be the ice melting away. There would be the icebergs coming down the lake, kind of ramming into the shoreline here because the ice is still so close. And this is, of course, a place that you will go in Iceland if you come with me. Anyway, great stories are in rocks and landscapes, right? That's my big claim uh, to, of interest here in, in the world is to tell people about these great stories. And I assure you, most of them are true. I should get a nod or a smile. <laughs> okay, so studying geology will help you read these great stories. Let's go on. Do you know there's only three types of rocks? How many people have had a geology course? You know, about the igneous, the metamorphic, the sedimentary. So the igneous rocks were once molten. Everything gets eroded to sediment eventually, and that becomes sedimentary rock. Metamorphics change by heat and pressure if it's, if it's stuck in a collision of uh, continents, for instance. So let me tell you about this important igneous concept. So if you look at the igneous rocks, you can either be deep down here in a magma chamber where the slow, where there's very cool, very slow cool, or you could be erupted quickly and be a lava flow where the cooling is very quick. So what's the difference? Great history here, but what's the difference? Boy, they look so different because a lava flow is called extrusive. An example would be basalt. <clears throat> and basalt is kind of a dark, ugly rock many times. You see it as crushed stone all over the place. And, you know, it's not very attractive. But if you can slow cool it in a magma chamber for perhaps a million years, then the elements come together to make minerals of bigger sizes, and you have things like granite. Not a really great granite picture, but many of you probably have granite on your countertops, you know, something you could really enjoy looking at. Because you can see all the crystals that formed as they cooled deep in a magma chamber over maybe a million years. Now we're going to go back into to deep time here. So if you put the geologic time scale across your body with your outstretched hands, <laughs> you will see that we're going to skip the first 80 <laughs> percent, pardon me, and we're going to go right to the Paleozoic. So the Paleozoic time is closer towards where we are today than the beginning of the Earth. But there's fossils, and we know so much more about the later history than we do about the earlier history, just like with human history. So if we go to the Paleozoic era, starting around 600 million years ago, where were we? Well, North America was on its side. The <coughs> east coast zone of North America was south of the equator. Now, in this drawing, they put the Great Lakes in in Hudson's Bay, but that's just to orient you to North America. These were not here in the <coughs> but the big story for us is New England isn't even here yet. The, the edge of North America was over around Albany and up to Lake Champlain. It was way over there. So New England is not even here yet. But there's a series of islands that are going to come and <coughs> crash into North America. And these islands are going to go by plate tectonics and eventually collide with North America. Now when they do that, they have to pass over the ocean crust. Because with plate tectonics, you know, these pieces are moving one relative to the other. The ocean crust has to go down out of the way. It's a process known as subduction. So how are you folks on your geology training? Have you heard about subduction before? Right? Great. So that's the process. The continental crust is lighter. It floats higher in the Earth than the ocean crust. And so it's able to push over the ocean crust. The ocean crust goes down. That's subduction. 
Now, I would like to share with you the world's <laughs> only subduction <laughs> joke, if I may. And so here it is. You've all seen subduction in a totally different format. There's the duck on a pond, the duck dives, and that is subduction. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh. Oh. Okay. So that's kind of an interesting joke, I think, because the process is similar to what we have in geology, where you have something going down underneath something else. So subduction, there it is. Can you ever forget that? <laughs> so here we are. These plates are coming towards North America. It's subduction going on. And then we get collisions as they come closer and closer and, and merge with North America. But if you were here at this time and were to look around at our landscape, there are erupting volcanoes and earthquakes just like the Pacific Northwest. <coughs> we could have landscapes just like this here. <coughs> Old volcanoes, the ocean was nearby, maybe a crater lake. So that was our landscape here because we're on a subduction zone. You know, this is a piece of land that's moving towards North America, and we're on the subduction zone. Well, let's take a look at where North America itself is going to go here. 750 million years ago, which is late Precambrian, we were right next to this, what is now a separate continent. But North America, and you'd never guess this, but geologically as they trace the path of North America, our east coast part of North America actually scrapes a, a, around and close to the west coast of South America. And mm -hmm. You would have guessed that, right? Mm -hmm. Finally, crashing into North Africa, right up there, that's how we fit together, and we get the mm -hmm. supercontinent of Pangaea and the Appalachian Mountains as a result of the collision, and so there we are. Great story, but what's the evidence? And indeed, it comes from rocks. If we look at the rocks from that collision, they are all squeezed up deep in the earth, now exposed by erosion. But deep in the earth, it's a rock like this. Uh, this was from Shelburne Falls. But it's a rock called Nice. So I don't have time to talk too much about this in detail. But this is my pet rock today. It's a Nice. You can see layers here, light and dark. But they're not sedimentary layers. They're mineral layers. And so I call this my pet rock. It's not just a nice from deep in the earth, it's a nice that preserves an earthquake. Ta -da! Can you see that the layers don't quite line up? Look at that. <coughs> see, they don't wow. quite line up. So, when you break a rock, that's a quake. Now, whenever there's a crack in a rock, uh, fluids will tend to come through and re-cement it back together. Typically, quartz will come in here. So, here is an, earth, an old earthquake, and one side has been cemented back to the other. Now you're going to say that what kind of an earthquake was that because the offset is only this much, right? It was a small one, right? But maybe when this cracked, it was the result of movement from the world's biggest earthquake that was 100 miles away, you know, when the waves went out. And this, this yeah. So you don't really know. But there it is, fossil earthquake in a metamorphic rock. Isn't that nice? Yeah. <laughs> okay, this is a from a glacial deposit that was uh, under the French King Bridge, basically. Uh, <laughs> on Let's all go. Yeah. Field trip. <laughs> yeah, one of my students found this and donated it to me, so it's been my pet rock ever since. But it's one of these guys here from the collision. And the force of the collision in this nice rock, you can see how banded it is and bent. I mean, that's an artifact of this collision. Lots of compression. Now, some other things you may not know about the evidence of the collision is this. We have a lot of slate around, right, and slate roofs. What does the slate mean? It's a metamorphic rock, but if you go back to its sedimentary origins, this is mud in the old ocean before Pangaea. See, between every continent, there's an ocean. Hey, I bet you never realized that. <laughs> now you do. And when you push the continents together, the mud from the old oceans becomes the rocks that get squeezed up and perhaps metamorphosed like we see here. So the slate on your roof is the mud of the old ocean before Pangaea. And then we have this nice white rock, which you can buy today in big bags from Lee Lime <laughs> and perhaps around your flower beds, and that's marble. Marble is mud, but it's got more calcium in it from plankton shells that filter down from that old ocean. And so that's the origin of the marble. And of course, there's a marble belt that goes all the way from western Massachusetts into Vermont down into Connecticut. And Lee Line, you know, hey, that's uh, where you get 
that's where the marble is from Lee Line there. It's also in Tums, by the way, so if you've had a Tums uh -huh. sometime, you are having calcium, perhaps from Lee Line, because uh, that is run by Pfizer, the quarry there. Now, I shall, shall tell you that you're not getting crushed rock directly because they take the marble and they crush it. They dissolve it, and then they re-precipitate it to make it a little bit more pharmacy grade than just a crushed rock. <laughs> okay, so that's the Paleozoic, and if you're having trouble remembering what's happening when, Paleozoic starts with P, Pangaea starts with P, so in the Paleozoic we have Pangaea, creation of Pangaea, and when we think about Pangaea, it happened in the Paleozoic. So these pieces came together, we made the Appalachian Mountains, and that's the Paleozoic. Today, we're quickly going into the Mesozoic. Now, when we go to the Mesozoic, we're going to break Pangaea. And you can remember this because whenever you break something, you make a mess. So we're going into the Mesozoic. Okay, that's kind of lame, isn't it? But anyway, in the Mesozoic, we break Pangaea. So let's take a look at the break. This is really important for us sitting right here today because that's why we're here. When Pangaea broke, there was a whole series of cracks that made these rift valleys. <coughs> the biggest one happened where the Atlantic Ocean is today. But we have this big crack also that goes right through our valley. And it, you can trace this crack called the Eastern Border Fault all the way from Keene, New Hampshire down to New Haven. The distance from top to bottom is around 30,000 feet. So think about that. You have like six miles of drop. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't mean that the valley was six miles from bottom to top at one time because it keeps filling in. See? But the total drop was six miles roughly. So it was, a, it was a big crack, but it wasn't big enough for the ocean to come in here. So we didn't get the ocean, but we got a big crack nevertheless. And into this big crack, there come sediments. Now here's a rift valley from out west. And if you take a look at the dynamics here, the shapes here, the landscape shapes, so uh, we have the mountains. The fault line is right along the base of the mountains. So you see the valley drops down. And then the rain comes out of the mountains. The rivers come out of the mountains into the valley. And they deposit sediments here in a big fan shape. Those are called alluvial fans. So we have the alluvial fans up against the mountains, shorelines and lake beds. Another place that I really love to go is Death Valley, but in the <coughs> winter, not in the summer. Don't plan your trip to Death Valley in the summer. <coughs> but it's a rift valley. The whole western part of our, of our country is breaking up. Um, it's below sea level here, but even a little bit further south in Palm Springs, it's below sea level. Uh -huh. And if you take another hop, skip, and a jump, you land in the ocean at the Sea of Cortez, uh -huh. you know, just off of Mexico there in Baja, California. So the ocean is on its way in. So if you want a prime <laughs> chance to buy shorefront property <laughs> somewhere in here, you know, there's going to be, the ocean will be here. So in any event, let's take a look at the Rift Valley. So there's the mountains. We have the fault line, the alluvial fan, shorelines and lake beds right here, but they're dry. So all these things are just displayed right here. And I love going to Death Valley because it reminds me of the Mesozoic Connecticut, Connecticut Valley, but it doesn't have hungry dinosaurs. Ah. So we see the landscape, and it's safer. <laughs> so, if you take a look at the geology of how we know all this, if you're on the alluvial fan, you've got gravelly rock, and it's called conglomerate. If you're on the shoreline, you've got sandy rock. If you're on the lake bed, you've got muddy rock, shales. And when the shales, when the mud dries up, it can even preserve raindrops. You see those little circles there? That's raindrops, individual drops, 200 million years old. And then the mud dried, and these are the remains of the mud cracks. They've been filled with sand, but that's the cracking of the mud. So there's a weather forecast from 200 million years ago. Okay, so the Mesozoic is famous for, guess what's going to be the next picture? Uh, of course, dinosaurs. Now the dinosaurs in our valley here, was, that was not Tyrannosaurus rex, because we are in the uh, well, the beginning to early middle of the Mesozoic. So we're in what's called the late Triassic and early Jurassic. Everybody's heard of Jurassic. So yeah. we're in the early Jurassic for most of our valley. And this is the dinosaur called Dilophosaurus. Left prints up and down the valley all over the place. Here's the famous one in Holyoke uh, along Route 5 and 10 there. Um, or Route 5, I guess it is. 
And this one is quite famous because the only dinosaur in the world that dropped a pocket knife. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I have a, a student that drew this cartoon and said, well, just like today, there was a big social life in the valley. So <laughs> they all came to dance. Now, dinosaur footprints and dinosaurs, everyone's heard of them. But put that into an ecological context. This was a rich valley with plants and water sources, rivers and lakes. And we find a lot of fossils besides the dinosaurs. But there are the reptiles, amphibians, and fish, clams, crustaceans, <coughs> and lots of insects that burrowed their way through the rocks, leaving tracks and traces. And lots of plants. But we don't see a lot of plants because they decompose too uh, rapidly. So the plants are not represented in the fossil record as much as they would have been when they, when they were here living. And now, the amazing story of armored mud balls. Is everybody awake for this? Yes. <laughs> All right, here it comes. So armored mud balls, what are they? And how did they get discovered? Well, uh, that's a six inch ruler for scale. Uh, I came here from California when I got my job in Greenfield and was exploring down by the river in Turner's Falls. Anybody familiar with Turner's Falls? The river's okay. Yeah, so we're at Unity Park here. So when I got to the river, there was a park. I parked. I looked out my car window and I saw this foundation that's you know cemented in here with some nice rocks on the top there. But um, I saw those circles. Now I know all of you would have gotten out of your car and walked five steps and said, huh, what is that? Well, when you look at this, that's mud, now stone of course. It's set in a gravel, which is an old river deposit. And so I said, well, that's an armored mud ball. As the mud ball rolls downstream, it gets soft, round, and sticky on the outside. As it continues to roll, it picks up pebbles that just stick in the ball. That's what we call the armor. OK, the dime was put there just for scale, but I really wish I could find an armored mud ball with a dime in it. <laughs> that would date it really, really well. Wouldn't it? That would be quite the story. But you can see the structure here. So here's your river deposit, the conglomerate that it's in. Look at the pebbles that are just stuck in the outside. Once again, that's the armor. And there's uh, kind of a sandy mud, a mud ball. What so got them rolling? What's that again? What got them rolling? Oh, what got them rolling? Uh, they were just eroded by the stream. So you can imagine a stream bed with layers of hard mud that might be you know, 10, 20, 50 years old, whatever, but hard, hard mud not soft soupy mud. And then as the stream is doing its cutting back in the Mesozoic, uh, see these are all 200 million years old. Yeah. So the mud chunks would have fallen in the stream and just tumbled downstream. Um, so anyway, you now know what armored mud balls are and I'm going to move on to some recent armored mud balls. So here are armored mud balls that are probably not going to be preserved because they were rolled out into the farmer's field in California, and then the sun's going to come out and they're going to fall away. But I just wanted to show you that armored mud balls are being formed today, but the trick is to get them in the fossil record, in the rock record. Now, a fellow who lives near here, his name is Will Sillen, he's an artist. He's done a beautiful artwork at the Vanesky Museum and, and other places. But uh, Will likes to go out west and hike, take pictures of the desert landscapes, and then come back to his studio to, to paint. So he was walking in Factory Butte, Utah. Now, how many people have been at Factory Butte? <laughs> OK, I never heard of it either. But you know, over the past year, I've had five, uh, about three people raise their hands and said that they had been there, which I thought was pretty surprising. I guess I'm missing something. So anyway, Will starts his walk and sees armored mud balls that have rolled out right there beside the trail. These are about a foot high. Wow. And there's the mud drying up, you see. So I thought that was incredibly amazing. And about the same time, I was at Guadalupe Mountain National Park, which is right near Carlsbad Caverns, New Mexico, you know, where we are now, out there. New Mexico and Texas come together there. So I'm at uh, Guadalupe Mountain, and there was a big flood eight months earlier that came out of the limestone mountains here, up to the left, down this canyon. You can see all the white colored rubble here. Uh, these are all limestone blocks that were tumbled by the flood. So it was a really pretty significant event. 
So they have a nature center there, and I'm walking along a paved path right from the nature center, and I spy an armored mud ball. Can you see it? Right there. So I'm walking along the path, and I said, wait a second, that looks like an armored mud ball. So that's my wife for scale there. So we went over to investigate, and sure enough, there it is. There was an armored mud ball. There was only one. And I could not, for the life of me, figure out how, in the midst of all that tumbling of the limestone blocks, where the mud came from, because I never saw any outcrops of mud up the little channel there, although I didn't get a chance to go too far up. But it survived the flood and was deposited over the bank, and there it is, an armored mud ball. <coughs> so, my God, I was absolutely <laughs> stunned. Just is that, absolutely. Is that recently stunned. formed or is that very old? No, no, this is recent. Yeah. Right, yeah, so this is all recent. So that'll so, fall apart. <clears throat> there was so. a slide I just, I missed that said only 10 places in the world. What? Yeah, there's only 10 places in the world where armored mud balls are preserved in the rock, mm -hmm. lithophron, mm -hmm. you know. So there are mm -hmm. a fair and number of places. Falls is one of them. And Turner yeah. Falls is one of them, yeah. So anyway, this was March 2015, and then I had a chance to do this same trip the next year, so I bet you'd like to see what it looks like oh, a year later. So there it is. So if I had seen it a year later, I don't think I would have recognized it, but, but there it is. Anyway, that's the Armored Mudball story. So this is actually a historical picture of me back in the 1980s. <laughs> I still have those pants. <laughs> um, anyway. That's a shame. <laughs> it's probably worth something these days. <laughs> so anyway, here's the river. This is Unity Park. And the reason why this, this uh, foundation was here is because, this is a painting, there was a suspension bridge across the Connecticut River from Turnus Falls, Unity Park, and over to Gill. Today, if you go to this area, it's flooded. It's called Barton Cove. Oh, yeah. And you know where they put the barrels across? Mm -hmm. Okay, the barrels to keep people from going over the dam and the waterfall. Um, the barrels are right at the spot of that bridge. Oh. So anyway, you uh, can follow this, this um, suspension cable, which has to come down into an anchor. And this was the anchor. It was coming right in to this. So that was one of the suspension cable anchors. So these rocks were quarried um, in the late 1800s, and they were quarried locally right from Turnus Falls. And it was just lucky that they were quarrying these layers that had armored mud balls, because they took the rocks with the mud balls out and placed them. And we can get them now. So the town of Turnus Falls uh, gave us permission to take this down and preserve the specimens of importance. And so we have them at Greenfield Community College. There's also some still at Unity Park. So if you go to Unity Park, you can see some pieces there. But those abutments, uh, foundations, are now uh, dismantled. At GCC, we have a new geology path, and the Armored mud balls are in their own little section oh. right there. So if you come up to GCC, you can find this. Uh, it's not like going to UMass. We have uh, like one big brick building. And this is right next to the southerly edge of that big brick building. OK, so back to the show. show here. We're splitting Pangaea. And when we split Pangaea, lava comes out. It's called flood basalts. It just floods over the landscape but no big volcanoes. So the continents are splitting, and this is from Hawaii, this is from Iceland, uh, not the place that we saw, but it's from the internet. Um, this is the, an Iceland eruption, which has a similar type of thing as what we would experience here. So the, basalt, so the basaltic lava is just coming out of these cracks and flooding like a flood over the landscape. There might be some small volcanoes like spatter cones and maybe some cinder cones, that are only a few tens of feet high, but not a big volcano. This is one of the big misconceptions I think people have about our uh, Holyoke Range lavas. So this is what the Mesozoic would have looked like right here in the Amherst area, covered by this big sheet of lava, but no big volcanoes. Now, if there were big volcanoes here, this is what you'd expect to see. The ancient volcano itself would have been eroded, but we would still see the harder parts of the structure of the volcano. Mm -hmm. We would see things like this. 
Uh, Nothing like uh -huh. this up and down the Connecticut Valley. So what we have is a lava flow, and there is a kink in this lava flow. Today, you know, it, it forms a ridge line, and I should tell you that it forms a ridge because the lava flow initially came out flat, almost like a sedimentary layer. It comes out flat as it floods across the land. But remember the eastern border fall. How are you doing? Remember the eastern border fall? The eastern border fall tips everything down to the east. So the main trend of the Holyoke Range is dipping towards the eastern border fall. And so when you tilt these layers and then erode them, the hard part of these layers would be the, the basalt, and that's going to just stick up. So that's what we see here is a tilted layer and then you erode the weaker rocks around it and so it sticks up because it is just harder. But let's find out why it has this hockey stick bend in Amherst because everybody's interested in that, right? We have this east-west part of the range that's over here. Well, when the eastern waterfall went down, it also wrenched laterally. And so the Seven Sisters, I think you're familiar with those yeah, yeah. dips in the range, each one of the little valleys between the sisters is a fault line. And the fault lines are weaker than the areas in between the faults. So you got these little faulted offsets because of the wrenching around. As we come close to the eastern border fault that's over there along Route 116, the whole thing wrenched laterally and it broke up into a series of faults. And the erosion, like I said, of those faults gives you the seven sisters. But if you get a little bit further away from the border fall, then you have the more traditional north-south dipping east structure of the Holyoke Range. So it's like a tilted book. And this uh, is a diagram from um, Connecticut. But you can see the tilt here of the lava. This is the Holyoke Range. This is the continuation into Connecticut. And it keeps going and going and going. It's broke, broken up by some faulting right here around Hartford. That's why it's so complicated. But you can trace this all the way to New Haven. The Holyoke Range goes all the way. That's that one lava flow. It goes all the way for that extent. So it's, uh, it's an amazing event. If you take a closer look at it, there's Titan's Piazza right there, <coughs> looking south from Mount Sugarloaf. Have you seen the columns of Titan's Piazza, perhaps? Mm -hmm. These are not crystals. This is just a cooling pattern in the basalt, because it comes out liquid. And then it cools. Anything that cools will <coughs> shrink. And so these are just shrinkage cracks that radiate down into the lava. And then as you erode the lava, pieces fall away and reveal the structure here, just due to the cooling. You've all seen with this with mud. You know, mud does the same thing. Mud dries and cracks. You get those six-sided mud cracks going down into the mud. But let me tell you something you didn't know. Sometimes when you look at the lava, you don't see the columns. You see roundish circular structures like this. So this is up in Greenfield. These are called pillow lavas. And sometimes when the lava came out, it flowed into lakes here in the old valley. This is not Lake Hitchcock, but a 200 million year old valley. And if you look closely at these, this is one that hasn't been broken through. But it almost looks like a pastry crust on the out surface, outside surface. Imagine almost 2,000 year old uh, liquid lava going into a lake. You know, it's going to cool quickly, it's going to quench quickly, and this is just where the surface is broken off. So if you see basalt columns, that means land. If it flows into water, it's going to be pillows. And note, it's not Lake Hitchcock. <clears throat> now I'm going to uh, show you a kind of a typical outcrop. Anyone been to Goat Peak across the river? There's a, a fire tower you can climb there. Anyway, this is kind of an ugly looking rock, but nevertheless, you're looking at the Holyoke Basalt, and you might note that there's no columns here. And if you look a little closer, you can start to see little circular structures, and that's a pillow lava. So at that point, this lava was flowing into a lake. Now, if you did a hop, skip, and a jump less than a mile away, you'd be at Titan's Piazza. There are no pillows at Titan's Piazza, so it means Way back 200 million years ago, you'd be standing in a lake here, but a little further away, you'd be on dry land. Because this is the same lava that came across, right? Columns versus pillows. 
And now we're going to test your interpretive skill. We're on the halfway house trail to the summit. And here's the contact between la layered sedimentary rock underneath and the lava. What do you think? Is it columns or pillows? Oops. Okay, it was columns. Uh, very good. Okay, let's get to the ice age quickly here. How are we doing for time? Okay. Yeah, five minutes. Okay. Uh, we, we can finish in almost five. But if you have to leave, go ahead. If you need a note for your employer. Um, go ahead. So, the last ice age. We're really skipping up to the present because the last ice age was at its maximum only 20,000 years ago. Like, whoa, we're not talking millions anymore. This was just yesterday. So the ice used to be way down here at Martha's Vineyard, Nantucket, out to George's Bank, and on the other direction down to Long Island. So the ice does erosion as it scrapes across the landscape, scrapes and polishes rocky surfaces, leaves bouldery soils behind, and if you're on those bouldery soils, you may have a natural stone wall in your backyard. Um, please note that the glacier didn't build the wall, but it did bring the stones. Now, we've got the Lake Hitchcock story here, of course. So, where are the stones in Amherst? Down in the lowlands of Amherst, where all the fields are here and surroundings. You see, the stones are there, but they're under all the lake deposits, because the lake came after the stones were deposited. So the glacial till is down there, but then when the ice melts back, you've got a lake, and all the sediments of the lake are going to bury the stones that you would find up here. If you go up beyond the shoreline, that's where you find the stone walls, because once you hit the shoreline and below, you don't find the stones because they're buried. But I want to talk about deltas a bit, because when rivers come into <coughs> lakes, they build deltas. And deltas have a structure like this. They have a flat, topset part as the rivers build into and up to the lake shoreline. But the more interesting part is what's underwater. The front of deltas are steep. They're called forset beds. And as you go towards Sunderland here from Amherst, um, to get the arrow direction, you'd be going this way. But as you go uh, past Bub's Barbecue, and you're going right across the front of a delta. This is the exact picture of what you're going past uh, on Lake Hitchcock. The shoreline and the delta are just off here to your right. And there's a gravel pit. Anyone know what the name of that gravel pit is? Warner. Uh, it's owned by the Warners, but it's, the company name is Delta Gravel. <laughs> you see it right on the side. Fish hatchery just across the road. That's on the lake, the clay of the lake floor. You see, so you mine the gravel, that's the shoreline area. But the bottom of the lake is more clay rich. And so that's where the fish ponds are. They're on the clay because you don't want the water to drain away. So looking into the Warner gravel pit there, Delta gravel, you see these layers that are tilted towards you. Those are the forset beds that are being de that were deposited in the lake. You know, the short that would be the underwater part, and then the top layers are flat. Those are the top set beds. Let's go to this gravel pit to illustrate this. Not the exact same one, but similar structure. You see how these layers are tilted. Now, if you didn't know about deltas and you knew a little geology, you would say, "Oh my gosh, these used to be flat, and there must have been big earthquakes to tilt them all up like this." But no, this is just the natural deposit in a delta. So when this delta was being built into Lake Hitchcock, when the foreset bed was here, the top set bed would have been there, and that would have been the shoreline. And then through time, it builds out and out and out, and up and up and up. So that's the structure of a delta. There's the stream flow. So top set builds, builds up as the foresets build out. And the shoreline is the contact between the top set and the foreset. So geologists love to find these things because that will do an elevation measurement there and you'll get the shoreline. And that's a cool story. And now, this picture from Alaska. There's the glacier. There's an ice tunnel from the meltwater. There's the delta top. And look at how muddy the lake is. Well, the muddy water is going to settle out. Mud is going to settle out of that water. And it will have a yearly deposit here. Because in the winter time, when the lake is frozen, the very finest sediments will have a chance to settle out. But in the spring and summer, when the river is going fast, it'll be more silty. And so the next year we'll repeat it. So every pair of layers is one year, and it's called a varve. And so we have those 
in great numbers here. <coughs> Uh, bricks are made out of the clay, by the way, so if your town has a brick industry, it's mining Lake Hitchcock clays. And in Greenfield, there was the Prey, Prey family that ran the brickyard, and so they put their name on a brick. And when you see some of these old bricks, I would tell my students, hey, pick up that brick that could be a message for you. <laughs> <laughs> and Amherst, it was ABC, it was the Amherst Brick Company. Oh, thank you for that, because I found those ABC bricks. Right, and I have one. Okay. So anyway, after Lake Hitchcock drained about 14,000 years ago, the river can come back to its valley and it will cut these river terraces. Wind will blow across the old lake bed, sand dunes, so we find sandy layers across much of the old lake bed. And so this is our landscape, folks. It's got an incredible history and wonderful soils. Best place in the world to study geology and what has been seen. <laughs> so that's the wow. end. Yeah. So I know some of you have to go, but I'll take like two questions and then uh, I'll be here to answer anything else. So are there two quick questions? Yes. Um, are the sugar loaves drumlins? No. Where that's, are they? that's bedrock. Uh, they're going the wrong direction, too, in terms of... Uh, well, they're not, they're, they're not too bad in terms of direction. But uh, there are drumlins on top of North Sugarloaf. Uh, you can see them on the map. But, but uh, drumlins are made up of glacial till, and Sugarloaf is, is bedrock, so it's just a bedrock. Um, well, Mount Castor and Pollux are drumlins, aren't they? I believe so, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, well, let me just stop it right here then. Please come up at your leisure. See an arm with one ball, buy a book if you want. <laughs> Touch the old balls. I mean the rock.